Right, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett. We're going to be continuing our teaching series this morning on such a great salvation. Uh, this will be part four of uh, a new series that we started uh, four weeks ago. Uh, but at this point in time, thank you for joining us. Just so you know, all of our teachings are archived on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. And we also want to say thank you to all those who have partnered with us with their tithes and their offerings. And in case you're wondering how to do so, you can simply go to our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, and you can visit our. Um, are we on? We good. Sorry, you can visit our website at lighthousedescapture.org and give on the give page. You can give anywhere uh, online, and uh, you can give from anywhere around the world. If you'd rather send us a check, you can simply send a check to Dave Evan Ministries, uh, our Lighthouse Discipleship Center at Light. Uh, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm jumping, jumping my message here because uh, uh, I'm having problems with the screen. I'll get that fixed in just a moment. But just so you know, you can, if you register send a check, if you go to our website, on the bottom of every page, you can give from anywhere uh, around the world. And just so you know, if you're in the U.S., our, all of your tax donations are 100% tax deductible, and we are a 501c3 church. So anyway, let me get my computer fixed here so we get back into the game here, and I can get back on track with my thoughts. As I thought I'm a little distracted, so let's reconnect here on the screen with my computer. Sorry about that. About that. We've been having some... Uh, technical challenges the last few weeks, and so we're trying to get those ironed out. And uh, so, just thank you for your patience. So, uh, let me just restart it here real quick. All right, here we go. So, anyway, uh, a lot of distractions this morning, but hopefully, we'll uh, get those behind us and so we'll be able to go forward. Uh, just so you know, all of our teachings again are archived on our website at lighthouseassembly.org. So anyway, I've been starting to uh, teaching on such a great salvation over the last four or five weeks. And this is actually a part, as I've said before, uh, a trilogy of what I call three different teaching series. I'm calling the Salvation Trilogy Series. Okay? And uh, we started with a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, on the essence of redemption. And then we're in the middle of teaching right now on such a great salvation. We are still in... Uh, this is part four, uh, and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail on that in just a moment. And then after I'm done with this series, I'm going to be talking about the new covenant of, in my blood. And so, <coughs> we'll be talking about our covenant relationship that we have with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? So we're talking again about such a great salvation in this teaching series. We talked a few weeks ago on part one of this series on the gift of salvation. It's really defining what salvation is. And defining it as a gift of God. It's not something you can earn. It is a gift that you receive by faith. It is grace, uh, it's by grace that you're saved through faith. And it's not, it is a gift of God. Okay? And then we talked about the purpose of salvation. This is probably my favorite of, uh, of all of, of the teaching series. Talk about the purpose of salvation. The purpose of salvation is not heaven versus hell. That's, one, that's probably the benefits of salvation. The purpose of salvation is a relationship with God. That's the purpose. God wants a relationship with us. And then we've been talking, starting last week, talking about the necessity of salvation. And I'll get that. <coughs> I'll get to that in just a moment as we'll continue that, that, that train of thought this week. And then uh, hopefully, sorry, next week we'll be talking about the benefits of salvation. Okay? And this is probably my second favorite area of this teaching. So we've been talking, starting last week, about the necessity of salvation. And I mentioned before that I have a lot of scripture in this uh, particular series, and this particular segment of our series. And I felt like this is somewhat of a shotgun approach because I'm looking at different angles of this, uh, the necessities of salvation. I, and I used the illustration last week that we are, it's like a prism. Salvation is such a beautiful prism, but we're going to be looking at this as many different angles of the, the necessities of salvation in this particular lesson. So let me recap a little bit of what we talked about last week because we didn't quite finish this, but I want to I want all that to be in your mind as we go forward with this this lesson as we continue to talk about the necessity of salvation. We've been talking the last several weeks about from John three sixteen to eighteen, where God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, 
<coughs> that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The purpose of salvation is that we have everlasting life. And that term for this is eternal life. And eternal life is a relationship with God. Okay? But the problem was that we were perishing. Why? Because of sin. So Jesus came into the world. God gave his only son to die for us so that we would not perish, but that we would have everlasting life, that we would have a relationship with God. Okay? But it goes on, and we've been talking about verse 17, for God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus did not come to condemn us. He came to save us. It goes on to say, verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay? So in other words, in, in recap from last week, Jesus came, came to save us, not condemn us. Okay? We need to understand that. That's important. Okay? Jesus' first coming was not to condemn mankind. His first coming was to save mankind. That's what we're talking about. So, uh, such a great salvation. At the second coming, and Jesus is coming again, Jesus was set as judge of all mankind. Jesus was condemned for us. We've got to remember that. Because even as we think of his second coming as judge, we have to remember Jesus was already condemned for us. He was already judge for us. So if we receive Jesus, Jesus has already received that judgment for us. We have to remember that. We cannot, when at his second coming, at the, uh, when he's judged, we cannot forgo the whole cross. We can't forgo the whole salvation. So now we're going to be judged for something that Jesus already judged for us. Making the, 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 the cross of no effect. Negating the cross. We can't, we can't, if we, th th that's the spirit of Antichrist. We cannot forget that Jesus was judged for us. He was condemned for us. But, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> if we reject Jesus, then we reject the fact that Jesus was judged for us. And if we reject, reject the fact that Jesus was judged for us, guess what? We're going to be judged. You're either in Jesus or you're not in Jesus. Either you're saved or not saved. Either have, have Jesus as your propitiation or you don't. And you'll be standing alone. In a sense naked, not in a sense of... of, 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 of of not having any clothes and being nude, but in the sense that you're naked without Christ. You don't have the clothing of his righteousness. You don't have the clothing of his glory. You're standing in your own flesh, and your flesh will go to hell without Jesus. Okay? We talked briefly about the great white throne judgment, because I, this needs to be explained in detail, and I'm going to go over it briefly again this morning in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, it's the revelation of Jesus. The book is not about judgment, it's about Jesus. And there is talking about the end time events, and there is talking about his second coming, but it's about revealing Jesus to us. And in, there, in this book, you'll see that there's two resurrections, there are two judgments, and there's two deaths. In simplest form, if you are born again, are born twice, you die once. But if you are born once, meaning you're not saved, you will die twice. There's two resurrections. There's the resurrection of the just, those who are born again. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's the resurrection of the unjust, those who are unsaved. And there's, you can also see this in the book of Revelation, that there's a thousand years separating between these two resurrections. Okay, the one... The resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. There's a thousand years separating the two. There's two judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ and there's the great white throne judgment. <coughs> and this word judgment gets people thrown off. Okay, let's look at the judgment seat of Christ real quick. You can look at it in more detail at these references here in Corinthians and Romans. And there's some other references too. I don't have these on there. <coughs> Excuse me. Trying to get that top out of my system. But this is not a judgment of sinners. This is a reward seat for saints. Okay? If you are in Christ, you're no longer a sinner. You are a child of God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And this is a reward seat. You know, at the Olympics, at the Olympics when they give out the, the gold, the silver, and the bronze, they are, in a sense, on a judge in a reward seat to get their medals. 
Okay? It's, it's, we also notice that the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a feast. This is a marriage supper. This is a celebration. Okay? And there's the reward is going to be handed out. Uh, and there's going to be crowns that are going to be handed, be handed out. You know, I'm not going to go into all that detail. That's not the scope of this message. But the great white throne, a thousand years la later, and we see this in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, but we also see this in, in verses 14 to 15, so basically the whole chapter. And this is a judgment of unbelievers, those who rejected Jesus. And they're judged for their works apart from Christ. Why are they judged for their works apart from Christ? Because they rejected Christ. They refused to believe in him. They refused to receive him. And so they're on their own. Okay? And, and the Lamb's Book of Life will be opened, and these people are not in it. They're not in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? They're cast, and those who are not in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire, and that's called the second death. Okay? You know, the whole thing about hell and damnation is that God wants none to go there. That's why he sent Jesus. Okay? And only those who refuse to believe in Jesus, those who refuse to receive Jesus, will go there. Okay? God's not being mean. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We go, we choose that to go there on our own if we reject Jesus. God doesn't send anyone there. We send ourselves there if we don't receive Jesus. Okay? But all who are saved by faith in what Jesus did will not be judged for their sins. We have to understand that. Why? Because, why, why is that true? Why do, why, make, why do I make such a bold statement like that? And some of you might have a hard time with that statement. Because all judgment came on Jesus for our sins. Either Jesus accomplished something, everything, or he accomplished nothing. And if we think that we're going to be judged for what the sins that Jesus was judged for us, then we're saying that Jesus did nothing. And we're mocking the cross. We might not, not, we might not be doing it with malice and spite, but we are mocking the cross. And that's wrong. That's, God will not commit double jeopardy. God will not judge the same sin twice. God is not evil. Okay? That's why that, that train of thought is so wicked and, 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 and crooked and reverse. Okay? All condemnation was placed on Jesus. God judged all sin. The sin of the whole world in the flesh of his son. But if we don't receive Jesus, we will be judged because we, re we reject our substitute. <coughs> it's like Jesus paid the bill for us, but if we will not accept that, if we will not accept the fact that Jesus paid the bill, then we have to pay the bill on our own. And what's the, what's the wages of sin? Death. We have to die. Okay? And so, why are those who do not believe in Jesus condemned? That's what I just answered, but I'm going to answer it again. Why are those who do not receive Jesus condemned? Well, it says in verse 18, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, Jesus. That's why. People are not going to be judged or condemned due to their individual sins. And I know some people don't understand that and don't receive that. They are going to be condemned to their singular, singular act of rejecting Jesus. You will not go to hell because of your sins. You will go to hell because you did not you rejected Jesus. Well, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteous of God. Well, if you reject that, then you still are dead in your sins. And you will be judged not so much for your sins. You'll be judged because you rejected the one who paid for your sins. Man's individual sins do not send them to hell. It's the rejection of Jesus that sends them to hell. <coughs> okay? Those who do not believe in the name of Jesus are already under condemnation. What condemnation? The condemnation of rejecting Jesus. The condemnation of the law. The law is a ministry of condemnation. And we've been talking about that for months and if not years. Again, the condemnation of because they do not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We also talked about last week how Jesus not only saved us from the wrath to come, but he also saved us from this present wrath. The present wrath is the curse of the law. It says in John 3, 36 that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall, see, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. <coughs> if you, again, what is everlasting life? A relationship with God. 
So if you didn't receive Jesus, you're not going to receive that life. You're not going to have a relationship with God. Instead, the wrath of God abides in you. Okay? God's not being mean. You just rejected. He gave you everything. He gave you life. He gave you himself. He, he took your sin and he paid for it in full so you would not have to die and go to hell. But you reject, if you reject that, God's not doing it to you. You are the one rejecting the best thing that you could ever have received. Okay? And Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we're going to get into a lot more detail when we get to part four of this message. We're talking about the benefits, but there's many, you know, sickness is a curse. It's a curse of the law. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we're going to get into that in a little more detail when we talk about that and the benefits, okay? And some other the curses of the law that he's redeemed us from, from as well. Not just sickness. Not just one aspect. Not just one benefit. Okay, but we also talk about last week how salvation is only found in Jesus. Jesus is the only way to be saved. Jesus said to him, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way to get saved. There is no other life except through Jesus. And Jesus is life. Without Jesus, there is no life." Okay, in Him was life, and the life was the light of man. John one four. Jesus is not a way to be saved. Jesus is the only way to be saved. There is no alternative. And any religion that teaches that Jesus is being a wonderful example, but don't believe Jesus is the only way to receive salvation, are false. Ophrah says that there's many ways to salvation. She, that's false. Okay. I know, I never based anything off her anyway, you know. But I'm just giving that example. People, there are people out there thinking that there's many multiple ways to salvation. That is false. And anyone who's sitting under that type of teaching is is is, is, a, is a fool. You're, you're it's, it's wrong. Okay. And if they're going to brainwash you in the most important part of, our, of the gospel message, then what else are they brainwashing you in? Okay. We also talked about last week how we are the children of God. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. We talked about this in John 1, 11 through verse 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There is supernatural power for those who believe in his name, those who believe in Jesus. This power enables us to become sons of God, or children of God, Da sons and daughters of God, if you will. Okay. Uh, and being a child of God is powerful. Okay. You have power that nobody else on earth has. The power is on you. The power is Christ in you. But because you are a child of God, you are born again. You are born of God. There's power in that relationship. There's power in that sonship. Okay, we also talked about how last week about bearing witness of Jesus, and we this is where we kind of left last, left off last week, and this one I'm going to teach this part again, going into our new territory. In John chapter three, we have the story of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus there is a Pharisee, and there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night, he came to him secretly, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. When on in verse 3 and 4, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I said to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. What convinced, we talked about this last week, convinced, what convinced Nicodemus that Jesus was God? It wasn't his teaching, but his miracle. Jesus did two primary things in his earthly ministry for three and a half years. He taught the word of God, and he healed the sick. He, healed, he did a lot of miracles. 
John writes this uh, in his book uh, that if, if all the miracles that Jesus did were written down, there would not be enough room for all the books uh, to contain everything that he did. Jesus did a lot of miracles. Okay, and we talked about this going back to verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're the teacher, come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. John 5, 36, a couple chapters later, John writes, but I have a greater witness than John's. Talk about Jesus. Jesus is speaking. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. That's the second time that Jesus talks about how the, it, the miracles bear witness that he is the Son of God. Miracles bear witness of Jesus. He goes on to say in John 10, 45, five chapters later, Jesus answered them and told them, told, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my, in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. He says it again in the same chapter, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Jesus says, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe what I say. Because he's teaching them and he's doing miracles. But he says, if, you don't, if I don't do the works of my Father, do, don't believe one word I say. That's Jesus saying. But if I do do the works of my Father, though you do not believe me, believe the works. That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a theme going on in the book of John here that he continues to write about Jesus. The miracles bear witness of Jesus. Miracles validate the ministry of Jesus. Miracles validate who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. And Jesus said, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But he did do the works of the Father. And in Hebrews chapter 2, Really, my main verse for this whole series, for this passage of scripture, for the word spoken through the angels proves that fast and every transgression and disobedience received just a just reward. How shall we, mankind, escape if we neglect so a great a salvation, which the first began to be spoken by, by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Verse 4. God also bearing witness with both the signs and wonders, with various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Gifts of the Holy Spirit is only one of the witnesses. Okay? Miracles, signs, and wonders are also part of the witness of who Jesus are. And I like it that the writer of Hebrews connects this, miracles, the miraculous, with such a great salvation. Okay? And why, and that's what that, the title of this series is, to, is talking about, such a great salvation. We're going to get to the benefits starting next week, hopefully, if I get it done far enough. Okay? I said last week, how arrogant of us to think that we can impact the world with less demonstration than Jesus. How arrogant of us that we think we can impact the world with less power than Jesus, less miracles than Jesus. Jesus himself told us that we can get the same results that he did. That we can do the same things that he did. He said in John 14, just before he went to the cross, he said, Most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater, he will do. He not can do, he will do. If we believe on Jesus, we will do what he did also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Why? Why is that true? Why him going to the Father have any significance? Because Jesus was on was on the eve of going to be with the Father to die on the cross. Jesus was on the eve of going, because this was the night before he was crucified, the night before he was arrested. Jesus was going to provide our salvation. Okay? Jesus told us that we can get the same results he did because Jesus was providing salvation through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And going, taking us all the way back to Nicodemus, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God. No one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus said, 
No one can do such miracles unless God be with them. How can we do such miracles unless God is with us, unless we are born again? Okay? So I want to take this train of thought. Uh, I, I thought about last week. I spent a lot more time with it last week. But I want to take this and transition to what does it mean to be born again? Okay? And we're going to use the same context as Nicodemus here. Jesus confirmed that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he first be born again. Salvation is essential to see the kingdom of God. How do I get that? John 3, 3, back with Nicodemus. Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Our spiritual man became dead, separated from God through sin. When Adam sinned, God told him, go down, he will surely die. He didn't die physically in that day and that hour and, and whatnot, but he died spiritually. He became separated, alienated from the life of God. And we too, until we received Jesus, we were dead in our sins. We were dead. In, you know, the word sin, if you say the book of Romans, it's used 47 times. And of the, uh, 45 of those 47 times, the word is a noun. It's not a verb. There is a verb, verb form of sin that the Bible talks about. But in the book of Romans, Paul talks about our nature of sin through Adam. We're either in Adam or we are in Christ. And when we talk about <coughs> being born again, we are born again. Our spiritual man is born again. Our spiritual man is regenerated. It's, <coughs> it, it's revived. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Okay. Remember in Romans 8, 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It also says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. It also says in, in Romans 7, 9, I was alive once without the law. <coughs> but when the commandment came, sin was revived and I died. Why? Because the law is a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. Romans 7, 11 says, for sin taken the case by the commandment deceived me and it killed me. Okay? Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you have been made alive who were dead. And your trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 5 says, For even when we were dead in trespasses, we made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, there's a lot of verses I'm reading here. I'm not going into a lot of detail, but the point is that we were dead in our sins. We were dead without Christ. We were spiritually dead. We weren't maybe physically dead, we really still had a pulse. Okay, you know, and whatnot. But we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead spiritually. And Jesus confirmed no one can see the kingdom of God unless he first be born again. That's what he says here in John 3.3. 3. We need, in order to see the kingdom of God, I'll go into more detail with that in just a moment, we must be first be born again. He goes on to say in verse 5, Jesus answered, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, Born of water and the Spirit, I'm going to break that apart in just a few moments, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So unless we are born again, we can't see the kingdom of God, and we can't enter the kingdom of God. And I'm going to break that down in just a few moments. Let's just talk about, real, let's just talk about being born, real. Just, just what it means to be born. Okay? First of all, let me establish this point. We can't establish our physical birth. You had no say in the matter when you were born. Mom and Dad got together, I'm not going to go into all that detail, and nine months later, you came into being. You had no, you had, you, you could not accomplish your own birth, physical birth. And even, even without the, the whole idea of the birds and the bees, you know, even you being in your mother's womb, you had no control of when you were going to come out. Okay, it just went, you, you couldn't accomplish, and even if you did decide when you were going to come out, you could not birth yourself. Okay? You, you are, you're helpless as far as your own birth is concerned. We also can't accomplish our own spiritual rebirth. Okay? And we'll get into some of that in just a moment. I'll, I'll qualify that. Okay? In other words, we can't save ourselves. That's where I'm going with this. You can't. You, can't, you, can't, you couldn't create yourself. And you can't save yourself. A, re, a new creation of Christ Jesus. You know, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a verse here in Jeremiah. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Are the leopard his spots? 
then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. In other words, without the life-changing power of God, we are helpless. Okay? Without the life-changing redemption of God through Jesus Christ, we are helpless. We cannot save ourselves. Man cannot change himself. Okay? Salvation is not a self-help program. That's where I'm going with this. <clears throat> are you following me? Salvation is a radical transformation of the power of God. Being saved, being born again, is the greatest miracle that ever took place. It's a miracle. Okay? Salvation is a radical transformation of the life of God. We cannot save ourselves. Romans says this, and it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Okay? It says in Romans 8, because the carnal mind, the natural mind, is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Ephesians says this, Ephesians 2, 3 says, Among those who also we all once, once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. One point I'm trying to make here is that the only difference between us and the world is Jesus. The only difference between you and someone like Hitler is Jesus. There's only one thing different between you and the most vile sinner you can think of, and that is Jesus. If there's anything good in me, if there's anything proper, if there's anything newsworthy, it's Jesus. Jesus changed my life, not me. Did I have a part to play in that? Yes, I had to believe and I had to receive. But Jesus changed my life. The only thing different between us and the world, the worst sinner, is Jesus. We need a Savior. You cannot save yourself. Titus 1.4 says, To Titus, a true son, in our common faith, grace, whatever, picking back on that we need a Savior. So I'm going to give you a lot of verses about this. A true son in the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Titus 2.13, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 4, But when the kindness and the love of our God, of God our Savior towards man appeared. And Titus again, Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through his, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out for us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. I can give you tons of other scriptures about this, but Titus has a lot to say about this. We simply believe on Jesus, and we are saved. Acts 16.31 says, And so they, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Let's take this back to John chapter 3. And Jesus answered and said, Most certainly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless he's born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. <coughs> Salvation is not a reformation. Salvation is a regeneration. What does that mean? Salvation is a new birth. Salvation is a new creation. Salvation is being born again. Paul says it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Salvation can only be accomplished by a creative miracle of the Holy Spirit. You being born again is supernatural. You believe it, or we, you believe in Jesus, or you don't believe in Jesus. But if you believe on Jesus, you are born again, and that is a creative miracle. Born of the of water and the Spirit, which we're going to get into in just a moment here. John 1.13 says that this, Who were born again, not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of God, but of God. Now I'm going to unpack some of this, what I, I said in just a moment, but let me just say this. We are born into his kingdom. 
We're not just born again. We are born into a kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. One day it will become a physical kingdom. But right now it is a spiritual kingdom. Because remember, he says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So we, if we're going to understand this, we need to understand something about the kingdom of God. And if, if we're not, unless we're born again, we're not going to enter the kingdom of God. There's that phrase again, kingdom of God. Salvation is essential to seeing the kingdom of God. And salvation is essential to entering the kingdom of God. You can't see it, and you can't even enter it. Maybe I should say it another way. You can't enter it, you can't even see the kingdom without being born again. So let's talk about the kingdom of God in brief. And I, I've done a whole message on this for years past, and sometime soon I'm going to do one again. But throughout Jesus' ministry, the Jews kept looking for Jesus to establish a physical kingdom on the earth. Throughout his ministry, they were always looking for him to establish a kingdom, a physical kingdom, and to deliver them from the Roman oppression. That was happening at and their time, and their hour, and their, and their era. Where does some of this come, stuff come from? It comes from, a lot of it comes from Daniel. I was watching the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which will, shall not be destroyed. Verse 27. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. The saints. <coughs> but the most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and shall not, all dominions shall serve and obey him. Okay, so... I'm not going to go all this detail with Daniel, but there was a promise of a kingdom that was going to be given to the people. And while they're being oppressed by the Romans, there's no better time to do that than now. Now is a good time. Okay? And so, but they, they didn't have a distinction between his first coming and his second coming. In the book of Luke, Jesus told his disciples, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. They were looking for a physical kingdom because of Daniel and other scriptures. But Jesus said, it's not with observation, it's within you. It's a spiritual kingdom. You can't see it with your eyes. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you can't enter that kingdom of God. How can you enter something you can't see? Okay? But we can see it. We're not looking for a physical kingdom. It's within us. Jesus said in another, another part of Luke, it's to my Father a pleasure to give you the keys of the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. Okay? Therefore, uh, Acts 1, 6 says, Therefore, when they had come together, this was after the cross, this was, this was when Jesus was going to be ascended. But just before he got ascended, the disciples, those, the multitude that were with him, the same people that were basically in the upper room, when, when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still looking for the thing. Jesus had already died, was buried, rose again, and they're still looking for this physical kingdom. Because their interpretation of the prophecy, prophecy from Daniel and other scriptures, they were, they were looking for this kingdom. They didn't even understand the cross. That's why they all forsook him. And now they're like, now that he rose again, okay, when are we going to do this kingdom thing? You know? And so throughout Jesus' ministry, the Jews kept looking for a physical kingdom to deliver from the Roman oppression. But at Jesus' second coming, the kingdom of God will rule over the kingdom of the earth. And we can see more of that in Matthew 25 and some other passages of scriptures. In Revelation, Revelation 11, 13, And then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It goes on to say in Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast of his image 
and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their heads, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. My point I'm trying to get to right now without going into a lot of detail with everything I'm trying to share is that there will be a physical kingdom, but there is a spiritual kingdom now. And unless you're born again, you can't enter that kingdom. Unless you're born again, you cannot see that kingdom. But salvation concedes us into his kingdom. Okay? We are part of a kingdom. A kingdom is where a king has dominion. The kingdom of God is established by his word, not carnal weapons. That's another point I'm going to come across real quick. I, I, I'm not going to get, do this, this point I'm making right now of justice, because there's a lot more I'm not going to share with this, but let me just say this from 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. But though for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the poor down strong hope. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing in every thought and captivity to be of Christ. What does this have to do with kingdom? Well, we're talking about war. We're talking about weapons. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking government with that right there. But, but anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we have the ability in the spiritual kingdom to cast down those arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring it into what? Captivity to the obedience of Christ. I don't have time to unpack all this, and maybe I open the can of worms just by bringing it up right now. But we are part of a spiritual kingdom. We're not using carnal weapons, we are using spiritual weapons. Because the kingdom of God is where? It's within us. It's not with observation, it's not a physical one. A physical one's coming, yes. But we are part of a spiritual kingdom. And the spiritual is more real than the natural. Okay? Jesus said that the kingdom of God is within you. If you're born again, you have been conceived into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you. And it's to our Father's pleasure, our Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. God has given you a kingdom. You have been born into a kingdom. Paul said we are already in the kingdom of God if we're born again. He said in Colossians 1, 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. If you're born again, you've already been translated into the kingdom of Jesus. The kingdom of God is Christ's invisible church. The kingdom of God is the body of Christ to be part to be part of the church, you must be born again. People have asked me through the years, how do you become a member of the church? Be born again. We don't have membership. I, you don't find that in the Bible anywhere. That's just a bunch of nonsense as far as I'm concerned. Have we ever asked people to leave? Yes, if they're hostile to other people, we've asked people to leave. Very rare, but we've had, we've had to do that. Okay? But to be part of this church, you just need to be born again. Okay? Can you come to this church if you're not born again? Absolutely. But we're going to encourage you to get born again. Okay? We're not going to hound you. We're not going to force it down your throat. It won't work anyway. But we, uh, we're going to teach. Uh, we're going to teach the gospel. Okay? Anyway, I can go more on that. Romans 12, 5 says this. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of another. There's a lot I can say about the body of Christ. But he also says, I'm saying in Ephesians 1, and he, God, put all things underneath his feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. Let's switch gears for a moment. Let's talk about born again requirements. What are some of the born again requirements? Again, remember, I'm teaching this, uh, the necessities of salvation from a scattered gun approach, and I'm looking at this from many different angles. And hopefully all these angles will come together as one beautiful masterpiece. John 3, 5 says, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We've already established that we can't accomplish our physical birth, and we can't accomplish our spiritual birth. In other words, we can't save ourselves. That's what I'm trying to establish. Okay? But people get hung up on this water and the spirit, being born of the water and the spirit. And in the same concept, Jesus says, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, 
Whatever is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Now, some people might disagree with me on some of this, but that's okay. You have a right to your opinion. Okay? I believe the water is speaking about a natural birth. For example, where a mother uh, uh, water breaks before giving birth. I have another, uh, I have another uh, alternative to that that I'm going to come back to uh, towards the end of this little section here. Spirit, the fire means a spiritual birth. I think most of us can, 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 can concur, concur with that. Okay? But the requirements being, in other words, what I, when I talk about this mother's water is breaking, and that, what I get kind of crucial with water and spirit is that the requirements of being born again is that you have to have a natural birth. You have to be human. You have to be man. And a dog can't be born again. A monkey is not going to be born again. Okay, you need to be you have a natural birth. Okay, angels can't be born again. They're not humans. Okay, and then also have a spiritual birth, which is Christ's seed, the Word of God. Okay, why right? we can, we have to be born of the water and the Spirit in order to be born again and enter the kingdom of God. I don't believe this is speaking of water baptism. Do I think water baptism is essential? Yes, we teach that in this church. Okay? But we have to remember that people were born again before water baptism. For example, Thomas. Thomas in John chapter 20. What happened to Thomas? And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. What is, how do you become born again? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. What did he just do? <laughs> my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. We also have Cornelius and his household. If you read the story, I'm not going to put it on the screen this morning, but Acts chapter 10, you'll see that they were born again and filled with the Holy Spirit before they were brought and baptized. I can give you many other examples of people being born again before water baptism. Okay? We, how do we become born again? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I won't want to baptize someone until I've, I've heard not just confession, but I want to hear the heart coming out in the confession that they believe. Okay? Again, people were baptized through were born again before they were baptized, and we, I give you many more examples. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ become made of no effect. Paul was not discrediting water baptism. You can find this in other where they did, uh, the, the, the disciples of Apollos, they did rebaptize them, because they were baptized in the water of John, and not the baptism of Christ. And that's a whole other teaching right there. Okay? But Paul was, was discrediting, was, was not discrediting baptism. Paul, but Paul did say water baptism was not the gospel. He said, God did not call me to baptize, but to preach the gospel of Christ. In other words, Paul would also say water baptism is not the gospel. Water baptism, I believe, is your response to believing in the gospel. Okay? I'm not talking about so much water baptism this morning. But I don't believe the water baptism is what uh, Jesus is saying in John chapter 3, being born of the water and the Spirit. Some groups spend much more time preaching water baptism than preaching on the redemption work of Christ. We've seen those groups, okay? And some groups spend much more time preaching water baptism than preaching on the gospel. And Paul makes a distinction between the two, okay? Jesus was baptized, but not to receive the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was baptized, but not to become born again. If you believe that Jesus was baptized to become born again, so you, 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 you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And John, in, in his first epistle, 1 John and also 2 John, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And that's wrong, okay? And so, uh, anyway, let's move forward. Again, Jesus said, in order to become born again, you need to be born of water and the Spirit. So I talked about how it could be the, the, the mother's water breaking, meaning that you're human, a natural birth, but also a spiritual birth. It could also mean the Word of God. This water could also mean the Word of God or both. Okay? But the only scriptural inconsistency would be water baptism. 
I don't believe that water has to do with water baptism. I believe in water baptism, but in a response to, not in a source of getting saved. Okay? But let's look at this word of God at first real quick. Which says in John 15, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He says in Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. James 1, 18 says, of his own, he will brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creations. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says, that, it might, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has given us the word of reconciliation. This fits perfectly, I believe, with the water and the spirit. I, I, I still believe that there's a connection with being uh, having a physical birth, but I, I can give you a lot of scriptures of the, of being water being saved by the word and the spirit, and he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Going on to verse 6 and 7, But that is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, he says, and I say to you, you must be born again. We shouldn't marvel at this whole expression of being born again. We shouldn't marvel at that. Because unless we're born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. We cannot see the kingdom of God. And he talks about the wind blowing. What did he say before? Okay. Let's switch gears again. Let's talk about the righteousness of faith real quick. And how it has to do with our salvation. Again, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, he will be saved. For with the, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Let's look at Romans 10 just for a moment real quick. In Romans chapter 10, Paul describes two types of righteousness. If you were, We were reading verses 9 and 10, but if you were to back it up to verses, chapter, verses 1 through 8, Paul, in context, describes two different types of righteousness. He talks about a righteousness of the law, that binds a person up, uh, uh, up in doing. And he also talks about a righteousness of faith that just receives what Christ has already done. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, Paul defines the two kinds of righteousness. One is by the law, it binds a person into what he's doing. The second one, the righteous faith, is just receives what Christ has already done. One is putting faith in what Jesus did. The other one is putting faith in what they are doing. It's called self-righteousness. And the Bible says in Isaiah that self-righteousness is like filthy rags. You are not saved by yourself. You are saved because you put faith in what Jesus did. Okay? And that is in this context that he, he goes into Romans chapter 10 and he talks about confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. Romans 10, 9, 10 stresses the simplicity of receiving righteousness by faith. Okay? Philippians 3 9 says, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So Paul didn't just talk about it in Romans, he talked about it in Philippians as well. So, again, Romans talks about Christians supposed to be receiving the righteousness by faith, but any attempt to amplify too much the conditions of these verses, Romans 10 9 and 10, would counter the point that Paul was making in the chapter. Because that's we can overemphasize something. And when we make it, when we over, when we, we when we overamplify some things, we can sometimes distort the message. Am I making sense? Okay. Uh, nonetheless, some explanations are necessary, and so that's why we were explaining some of this. We need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And sometimes we can overamplify both of those. Sometimes we can make it more about confession and less about believing, and we're off. We can sometimes make it more about believing, and we eliminate the whole confession part, and we're off there too. Okay, we're, Both components need to be in, in the equation, okay, in the proper balance. But if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart, we will be saved. Okay, But, we, but the heart one believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You are not saved just because you say the word, Jesus is Lord. You can be, anyone can cite, recite anything. Just because you say something, 
doesn't mean you believe it. Okay? There's a lot of things I had to say in school. Uh, my teachers wanted me. I mean, uh, I, I get off on it, especially when we read Shakespeare. We were supposed to give our opinion. I gave my opinion, so for some reason that was wrong. Uh, but I had, in other words, I, like I told my teacher, it didn't go over too well, but I said, so I'm getting graded on your opinion. So as long as I agree with you and your opinion, I'm right. Anyway, let's get off that horse. Okay, so I recited a lot of things I didn't believe. Okay, but anyway, you are not saved just because you say the words, Jesus is Lord. Okay, it, it's not just saying a prayer. Okay, nowhere do you find someone praying a prayer to get saved. They believe with the heart and confess with the mouth, Jesus is Lord. I'm okay with the prayer, but it's not just a recitation of something. We have to have both, the confession and the belief. Okay? I mean, you can, you can tell if someone's just confessing something, but they don't believe it. Okay? You can tell. How do you tell? You just start asking a few questions, and you can get the answer. Okay? You are not saved just because you believe Jesus rose from the dead. Is this essential? Absolutely. Both of these things are essential. Okay? But they both have to, they both have to be there. Okay? They have to confess and they have to believe. Okay? Let's look at this word confession real quick. And I can pronounce that in Greek. But it's more than just saying the words. When you are in a witness stand giving your confession in court, it's more than just saying some words. You better be saying the truth. Okay? It means to assent. It means to covenant. It means to acknowledge. Okay? This word, homologio. Okay? I big stab at it. But why do you call me Lord, he says in Luke 2, and do not do the things which I say? There's many people who call him Lord, Lord. That doesn't mean they're born again. Okay? Mark 1 24 says this way. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, That is the Lord. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Just because this guy is saying that he is Jesus doesn't make him say he had an unclean spirit. Okay? True confession of Jesus as Lord has to be heartfelt enough to involve action. There are some groups that interpret the word Lord that deny the deity of Jesus. Okay? This confession of Jesus as Lord has to be a declaration of faith. We must honor Jesus as Lord the same as we honor God as our Father. Jesus said this, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And why don't go there? Some of you might not have a problem with this, but there are people who do. Okay? And many religions only honor Jesus as a great man. Islam is one of those. Uh, Unif the Unification Church is another one. Jehovah's Witnesses is another one. And there are, there are others. Okay? But... Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Either he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. First, that's 1 John 3, 23. 1 John 5, 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who, who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. A Jesus who is less than God could not provide salvation. Okay? If Jesus was not God, if he was not the Son of God, he could not have adequately provided salvation for us. Okay? So we need to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. See, true salvation is a result of a true confession. A true confession. I'm not eliminating confession, but a true confession that Jesus is Lord. And true salvation is a result of a true belief from the heart. Both need to be there. Confession is a result of faith in the heart. Only when people have believed with the heart will confession release the power of God. If you don't believe it, confession is just words. It's idle words, okay? In other words, if you don't believe it, you're saying you're lying. Is that not what a lie is? When you're saying something you don't believe? 
Is that not bearing false witness? Okay. Uh, confession without sincere belief in the heart is dead works. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much so the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to cleanse your conscience from their works to serve the living God. Faith without works is dead. But true faith is never alone. Andrew Womack says this a lot, and I like that. James 2.17 says, Also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. See, people will speak what they really believe in their hearts. Jesus said it this way in Matthew, Brought of brought vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says it again in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man out of the good, good treasure of the heart brings forth the good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Romans 4, 17 says, As written, I have made you a father of many nations. He's talking about Abraham and God. And in the presence, <coughs> the presence of him, whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls the things which do not exist as though they did. Failure to combine both truths has prevented many people to be, to from receiving God. When this is going to come in handy when we get to talk about the benefits of salvation, healing, for example. If we don't. If we are just confessing something, but we don't believe it in the heart, we're not going to see salvation, healing, manifest. We need to believe it, and we need to speak it. Okay? Failure to combine both truths, confession and believing with your heart, prevent many people from receiving from, sal from God. Salvation, forgiveness of their sins, healing, prosperity, deliverance. Failure to receive from God has caused many people to reject faith teaching. Because it does, in, in, in their eyes, in their experience, it's not working. They reject the whole faith teaching. And on the other side of the coin, because they're not receiving, some people reject confession teaching. And both are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because you need both to work. That's why. Why Why do they do that? Because salvation is received by believing in your heart. And salvation is received by confessing with your heart. Not one or the other, but both. Faith and confession will always bring salvation. Always. It will always bring the healing. It will always bring prosperity. It will always bring deliverance. Faith and confession. Who are you putting your faith in? What you're saying? No. That is not faith. That's not true faith. Your, your faith is in what Jesus provided. Your faith is in Jesus, his grace. Not you. Not what you're saying. Not what you're praying. Your faith is not in your prayer. Your faith is in who you're praying to. Ask anything in my name. We can ask and not, we're still not believing. We're just going through the motions. We need to believe that he said what he said is true. That if I ask, I will receive. There's a difference between what we're putting our faith in us and we're putting our faith in what we're doing. One is righteousness by faith and one is righteousness by the law. Faith and confession will always bring holiness. Faith and confession will always bring healing. It will always bring prosperity and it will always bring deliverance. Faith and confession will always bring salvation. It says in Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is a grace gift. And all we have to do is receive his grace by faith. All we have to do is receive his gift by faith. Now let's Switch gears here for a moment and talk about this regeneration. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this word regeneration real quick in the Greek. It's a state of act of spiritual rebirth. Okay? What does that mean? It's a spiritual renovation, or figuratively speaking. It's a messianic restoration. Okay? We, in other words, we are reborn. We are redeemed. 
Regeneration. Okay? He also uses the word renewing. It is re re renewing mean, it means renovation. It, we've been, our mind has been renovated and our spiritual nature has been regened. We've been regened and we've been renewed. You know, sometimes when you have to, to, to fix up a house, sometimes you have to gut it out and put in new plumbing and new, new electrical wiring. In many ways, that house has been regenerated. And sometimes you have to put in new, redo drywall and whatnot, whatnot. Sometimes you have to do almost a totally do over. And that is renovation. Okay? But not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We've been redeemed, and we've been renewed. It's not by works that we have done. It's by his mercy that he saved us. Now let's switch gears one more time. Looking at another angels of salvation. Let's talk about falling from grace. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 3.27 says, Where is boasting then? It is a scooter by which law of works? No. By the law of faith, therefore, we conclude that a man is just by faith apart from the deeds of the law. All this salvation happens by grace through faith. Okay? Without us keeping the law. This is where most people have problems. Most people can't accept that they are sinners who need help. But most people don't have the revelation that right standing with God, which is righteousness, comes solely through faith in His grace. Most people believe we have to do something to earn salvation. They might not say it in those words, because if I say it that way, they would disagree with that statement. But most people in their belief system, and what they're confessing, and what they're believing in their heart, is that we have to do something to earn salvation. Okay? That belief or unbelief causes Christ to become of no effect. What do I mean by unbelief? It's belief that's un. Okay? The un makes it, it's a belief, but it's the wrong belief. It's belief that's un causes Christ to become of no effect to you. How do I know that? Because Paul said it. You have been exchanged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, by what you do, you have fallen from grace. Let's look at this verse in the King James. Christ has become of no effect unto you. That's what he means by being strange. Whoever of you are justified by the law, we are far from grace. I like both translations because in the King New King James, you attempt. You cannot be justified by the law, but you can attempt to be. Okay? Am I making sense? <coughs> Christ has become no effect to you, and whosoever of you are attempting to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Most people believe we have to do something to earn salvation. That belief, believing that we have to earn salvation, frustrates the grace of God. Okay? That belief causes people to fall from his grace. And that belief claims Christ died in vain. They might not use those words. They might not come to that conclusion. But that's what is going on. Okay? Galatians 2.21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteous comes from the law by what I do, then Christ died in vain. Paul, Paul doesn't hold back any punches in the book of Galatians. Okay? The belief, that belief negates the grace of God. It makes the cross of Christ of no effect. It means that Christ has died in vain. Paul says in Romans, and if by grace, then there's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But it is of works and there's no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. Any grace mixed with any work is not grace. The only thing needed to be right with God is faith in what Jesus did. The only thing needed to receive salvation is faith in what Jesus did. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Grace plus faith 
equals salvation. Now, if you don't, I know a lot of people, some people struggle with this, but this is, either you're in Christ or you're not. If you think you're saved because of something you do, you are a fool. Do I believe that we need to obey Christ and live holy, be holy? Absolutely. And we're going to get into that again in just a few moments. But like Martha and Luther, we need a new reformation in the church today. It's a reformation of grace, believe in the gospel. And by okay, grace is no longer worth for anyone. When I'm in this verse, go forward. For by grace you have been saved through faith. See, it was these verses that caused Martin Luther to, to cause the whole Reformation movement to begin with. He, he saw that it can't be grace and works both. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Just like oil and water, it doesn't mix. Okay? But by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. For it is a gift of God, as any man should boast. Again, Romans 3, 27. Where is boasting man? It's been excluded. By what law of works? No, by the law of faith. We've talked about this at length in times past. Boasting is excluded. No one deserves salvation. I don't care how good you are. Who wants to be the best sinner in hell? Either you have Jesus or you don't. You cannot bring forth your own salvation. You can't do it. If you think that's very arrogant of you to think that you can save yourself, in addition to Jesus. That's arrogant. That's full. Okay? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. There's so many scriptures. I wish I had time to, to, to unravel these in a lot more detail. But salvation is a free gift. We talked about this in the length in our first hour on talking about this. But let's switch gears one more time and talk about how the Holy Spirit is our teacher. See, the Holy Spirit is our teacher so we can know what has been freely given to us by God. That's what we just read here, back here. Now that we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, of, Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And he wants to teach us the things that have been freely given to us by God. I'm going this because we're going to go to the benefits of salvation starting next week. Okay, I'm going to go over a little bit because I'm going kind of to try to really hard to wrap this up. This part. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all things I said to you. That's John 14 before the cross, John 15 before the cross, but when the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father. <coughs> Excuse me, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Also in John 16, also before the cross, same context. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will guide you in the things to come. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, so if we can know the free things freely given us by God. He's our teacher. But we gotta show up for class. Okay? He can't teach you if you're not listening. He can't teach you when you want to learn everything on the fly. Sometimes you've got to be still and know that he is God. Psalm 46 says this, but be still know that he's God. I just quoted that. <laughs> okay? And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Titus 2.11, we've said this many times, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to man, man teaching us. Grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. I spelled age wrong. Aga. <laughs> Whatever that is. Okay? But, you know, some of you think when I talk about it's grace, faith in this grace, it can't be that simple. It's not something we can earn. You think, some of you are already thinking, I'm teaching you can live in sin any way you want to. No! Because that tells me you don't even know grace because grace teaches the, the nine sin and godliness. Don't mock the grace of God making it something bad. If you're thinking that I'm teaching that grace, teaching grace, 
gives you a license to sin, or that anyone who believes grace is a license to sin, you don't know grace. Because grace will teach you to deny godliness and worldly lusts. And to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Grace teaches us how to live godly. Second Corinthians 5, 19 says, That is, that God was in Christ reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us the word of reconciliation. Now, in closing here, and we're talking about the necessity of salvation, I want to go into, uh, and I'm not going over here, but I want to close this section of our study talking about the rapture real quick. Rapture, question mark. Okay? So some of you are going to want to listen to this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, and some of you are going to disagree with what I say, and that's why I don't teach on this a lot. Now let me give you some things about rapture. Why do I teach on this? I don't like talking about this a lot because it causes a lot of controversy. But at the same point in time, when I'm talking about salvation and the, 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 the necessity of salvation, I feel like I can't totally ignore this topic because it comes up. And a lot of you believe in this. And so, okay, so let's talk about rapture real quick. I'm not going to go a lot of detail with you. And I'm not, if you want to argue with me in the comments, I won't argue with you. I'll just delete your votes. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. You might have a different opinion. That's fine. Keep that opinion to yourself. Okay. Um, First Thessalonians 5, 9, 9, 10, real quick. For God did not appoint us to wrath. This is the main scripture that those who believe in rapture agree with. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation to our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Okay. Why people believe in a rapture? Okay. Because of one, one, the verse I just read. There's another verse I'm going to go to in just a moment. But Revelation shows an unprecedented wrath of God released on the earth and called the tribulation. Okay? And they quote from what I just read, verse 9, verse Thessalonians 5 9, that believers must be gone because God has not appointed us to wrath. So that's one of their, their uh, arguments that we must be gone because God has appointed us to wrath. And the great tribulation is all about God releasing his wrath. But a, so they, they, they just connect the dots uh, that way, okay? Where it says, but God did not appoint us to wrath, okay? But there's two things wrong with the rapture theory. The book of Revelation does show believers will be present during the... The first one is, I said there's two things. The first one is that the book of Revelation does show that people will be present, believers will be present during the tribulation. And there's several verses here, Revelation 6, 11... 727, 2 to 4, Revelation 11, 3, Revelation 3, 17 to 8, 7 to 8, and Revelation 14, verse 13. I'm not going to go into details right now. I'm not going to read these scriptures right now. You can read them on your own. Uh, okay. But regardless of what kind of believer you say you are, Christians will go through the tribulation. And now, some people just disagree with me right there, and that's fine. Okay. Just because Christians go through the tribulation does not mean they are expressing God's wrath. Who says that they are the ones experiencing God's wrath? See, again, there's two things wrong with the rapture theory. I talked about one of them. The book of Revelation says that we believers will be there. I didn't say you would be there or I would be there, but believers will be there. Okay? And I believe we're believers, but at the same point in time, I, can't, I don't know your, I can't predict your future. I don't know if you're going to die or something happens before that. Okay? The second thing is Christians will be miraculously spared from the place of God. How do I know that? Well, I have one prime example, and that's in the book of Exodus, when Israel went through the ten plagues in Egypt, but the plagues did not touch them. Same thing happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Same thing happened with Daniel. I can give you many examples. When God's plagues or wrath came on mankind, it didn't touch his people. See, Likewise, Christians will be miraculously spared from the wrath of God during the tribulation. Why do I believe that? Because God is faithful. Okay? They will be, I believe they will be, Christians will be on the earth, believers. But that does not mean they will experience God's wrath. I don't believe that for a second. No, they won't. Why? Because God's wrath is reserved for his enemies. It says in Nahum, 
Chapter 1, verse 2. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges, the Lord avenges, and mysterious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversary, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. If you are a believer, if you are a child of God, you are not his enemy. God reserves his wrath for his enemy. And just because you are on the same planet where his wrath is being poured out, doesn't mean you are coming under the wrath of God. It can't mean that. Okay? Many miss the fact that Revelation shows the judgment of God on the ungodly only. Christians will be stripped of stains from naturally just as they have always been. Throughout Scripture, even in the early church. I can give you an example. Peter, the angel came and rescued him from jail. Paul and Silas. I can give you an example after example after example. Our God has supernaturally <coughs> to stay his people. And he has always done that. Yes, there will be persecution. Jesus and all the apostles promised persecution. It's been promised. We've been promised persecution. Paul said in Timothy that any who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Another way of reading that, if you're not suffering persecution, maybe you're not living godly. But if you desire to live godly, you will suffer persecution. It's been promised. Okay? Persecution has occurred throughout the church history. From, from, the, from the first day, from the day of Pentecost, the church has been persecuted. We can't fabricate an escape just because we don't like what's coming. That's nonsense. That's immaturity. Our faith must always be in Christ. That's why it's the book of Re the revelation of Jesus. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus, not the tribulation. Our focus must always be on Christ. By faith, countless generations of believers before us have endured. By faith, we endure. Now, I mentioned that this verse already, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to take salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should together with him. Well, one of the main verses that the people who believe in rapture use is 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. <coughs> and we who are alive and remain, so we're still here, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Christians who are alive on the earth will be caught up, key phrase, caught up, together with the resurrected resurrect, resurrect saints. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 17 just said. Because then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and with other believers. Okay? This word caught up in Latin, sorry, my PowerPoint didn't go right. In the Latin, not English, means rapture. Okay? That doesn't take away from the word. It just is not an English word. It's a Latin word. Okay? In the Greek, it means snatch, sneeze. It denotes a sudden taking away. This sweeping away is that we meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Let's go back to the verse. And for the Lord himself will descend upon the heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Let's look at this word together real quick. The word together, hama, means at the same time. Okay? The dead in Christ being raised first, verse, verse 16, and then the living saints being changed and caught up at the same time to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? This verse, verse 17, has been used to prove the difference between what many call the rapture and the second coming. In other words, they make a distinction between the rapture and Jesus coming again. This verse says, we will meet the Lord in the air, leading some to believe that this is not the second coming of Jesus. Okay? And 
don't know about you, but I'm already seeing a problem with that. Many make a distinction between Christ coming into the atmosphere versus Christ setting foot on their soil. This interpretation makes this verse just an appearing of Christ in disguise versus the second coming. See, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 does not portray Jesus making a U-turn with the saints before coming a third time. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 also does not portray Jesus later descending to the earth, the soil, for a third coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 only describes us meeting the Lord in the air. That's the only thing it says. Verse Thessalonians 4, 17 does not describe what happens after we meet him, except for the fact that we're going to be with him forever. But, we do know this. Jesus is coming again. We do know this. We will meet Jesus in the air. Whether we're dead or we're still alive. But, there is no clear doctrine for rapture. Yes, it will happen suddenly. Yes, we'll be caught up with him in the air. But there is no doctrine that says we will be caught up before the tribulation. There's no doctrine for that. Most of us want that. That would be nice. And maybe it is. I'm not saying it won't be. I'm just saying I have no scripture to prove that. I'm not saying I'm right on everything. I'm not going to fight you on being right. I'm just going to, all I know is I don't see any scripture that validates that point. The rapture theory cannot be substantiated on this passage of scripture. It is just as logical to interpret this verse as the second coming of Jesus versus dismissing the rapture theory. But we do know this. And this is what I will preach. Jesus is coming again. We do know this. That we will meet Jesus in the air. And that's as far as I go with that. If you want to go further, then it's just based on your opinion. I don't have another opinion. I'm not saying I'm right on everything, but I do know Jesus is coming again. I do know that we will meet him in the air. I will argue on those two points. And the other thing I won't argue on because... And just based on, I'm just arguing your, your opinion or my opinion. It's all speculative. And I have no appetite, I have no time to have an argument about speculation. I can't put faith in speculation. I can't preach speculation. I'm going to preach Jesus crucified. That's what Paul preached. Paul preached Jesus crucified. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach about his first coming. He's coming again. And we will meet him in the air. Tomorrow will take care of itself. I don't need to worry about all those details. I just need to, whether there's tribulation or no tribulation, I need to preach Jesus. I need to preach salvation. I need to keep my focus on Jesus. I don't have time for this other junk. Okay? It's not junk in the fact that he's coming again. It's not junk in the fact that we're going to be with the air. It's just, it's not worth it. Me talking about this is not going to get anyone saved. Okay? Why did I talk about this? Because I'm talking about the necessity of salvation. And next week we're going to start talking about the benefits of salvation. Okay? And I'm not trying to burst people's bubbles, but some bubbles need to be burst. Okay? I'm here to preach of such a great salvation that we have. And we're going to get to some exciting stuff next week. Talk about wholeness. Talk about healing. Talk about prosperity. Some people don't like that. They don't, they, people argue with me that that, that about the tribulation, but they won't that, uh, that they won't receive that God wants to prosper them. Well, you can't have it both ways. So you don't want any tribulation, but you also don't want any provision. And I don't get that. Um, so uh, the word also means salvation means one of our benefits is that we can be experienced deliverance. So some of us need to be deliverance, deliverance from addiction. Deliverance from gossip. Deliverance from this and that. Deliverance from unforgiveness for other people. Some of us need to be delivered. Some of us are in, in, a, in an oppressive environment. We need some deliverance. Some of us have been wrongly accused. We need to be delivered. 
God promises to deliver us. And um, so we're talking about such a great salvation. We'll pick this up next week. Thank you for your patience. I went about 15 minutes over. I just didn't want to drag it. I didn't want to pick it up with Rapture next week. I want to get that out of the way and let's move on to better stuff. So anyway, God bless you guys.